Welcome, Catherine. We're going back to my home country for a local case, the Christchurch massacre. Now, it's something that I know because it was happening in my old backyard, but I don't think it's something that necessarily all of our listeners might know, especially the American-based listeners, but also how much that one Christchurch incident actually had global ripple effects out, which I'm sure you'll touch on later in the show. So what can you tell us? Let's get into it. Okay, so for the uninformed, and I apologize ahead of time for your local Kiwis who say I got some facts or pronunciations wrong. I was in the United States, but out of the FBI when this Christchurch shooting occurred. And I say shootings, and maybe the first thing I would say is it's shootings, plural. So often we talk about a shooting that occurred, but in this case, this was a killer who was hell bent on killing a lot of people in a lot of locations. And the shooting occurs on March 15th. We have a single gunman who attacks two mosques during their prayer services and two locations where there are mosques and schools, Islamic centers. And they are just like five clicks away, which is like three miles. And so March 15th, 2019, at 1.40 in the afternoon, enters El Nur Mosque and begins shooting. There are 190 people, primarily men, at the mosque for their Friday prayer service. The shooter has planned ahead of time and knows this, and before he enters the mosque, actually turns social media feed on to have live coverage. So this is part of the first traumatic aspect of this is that the social media coverage, a live feed of a shooting goes out onto the internet and lives on in perpetuity. And it begins to shoot and he actually starts shooting even before he enters the building, but he pulls up in front of the building. He begins to shoot. He shoots somebody outside who greets him. And then he goes inside and he begins to attack people of close range who are praying and shoots, and I'm going to summarize in the beginning here, just because I don't want to plow through too many details and too much horror, but he shoots and fatally wounds a number of people who are inside the mosque. As he fires it at these, all these worshipers, he goes out to his car to get another weapon, shoots at people out in the parking lot. He goes back into the building, shoots again. And this may seem like it's taking a lot of time, but it's really not because as he exits the building again, he shoots a woman who's outside and he drives away. And it's in only five minutes has passed. So just Gosh, a plain So five minutes. fast, isn't it? Five minutes. Mm-hmm. Now police get reports right away and they are on their way, but mm-hmm. they actually pass in the night. His car is going in one direction and he leaves as law enforcement is arriving And there is a big bus between them and law enforcement doesn't see him. And now I will. Gosh, sliding doors. Sliding doors. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Sliding bus. Yes, exactly. The good way to put it. So he takes off. He's driving very fast, like 130 kilometers per hour, which is like 80-ish miles an hour. And he is driving crazy, crazy, crazy because he's just going a few miles away down the road. And he gets to the Linwood Islamic Center that is just, like I said, three kilometers away. And it's the same plan, right? His plan is that he is going to there arrive at the center. It's only 12 minutes since he started. There are another hundred people inside worshiping at Friday prayer. And he pulls into the driveway. And as he gets out of the car, he begins shooting can't really figure out initially how to get inside the building. So he begins shooting through windows. He kills four people inside the building before he even gets there. And then gets inside and he begins shooting more people, climbs back into his car and heads towards a third mosque that he doesn't arrive at because law enforcement intersect him at this point and ram his car and stop him. That's how the incident ends in a handfuls of minutes. But is his social media feed live that entire time? It is for a total of 17 minutes. The second shooting, as he arrives at the location, the social media feed stops. Is that stopped by the social media platform or is that stopped by him by choice? Can they shut that down? 
They can shut it down. Okay. And I think they did shut it down. And I will say that they have in New Zealand, an armed defender squad who was mm -hmm. on the scene in 10 minutes which is really okay. how they were able to find this guy, intersect where he was headed and head him off and stop him. Or he would have probably just done the exact same thing, right? At his next location. So yeah. that's very sad. It's um, one of the parts of the story that I remember quite well when it happened was the bravery of the people that stopped him. There are some great bravery stories in the midst of all of this horror. I guess I would say that he was arrested alive, brought to police station. And, and I think part of that was that this third mosque that he was going to was up in Ashburton. Am I pronouncing that right? Ashburton. And really? so yeah, you are it's it's 50, quite a distance, 56 miles, right? 90, 90 kilometers. Yeah. So he was headed up there. He definitely mm -hmm wanted to get this as another target. And the one in Ashburton had opened more recently, like just a couple of years before they had converted a church that had been closed up and they had converted it and started to use it as a mosque. And they found out that this guy had been arrested on his way there. Imagine how the members of that mosque felt. Unbelievable. Right? You know, he had come to this country I think the final analysis was intent on committing this crime. And he was looking for an identified mosques that he viewed as his targets. So the shootings that did occur in the first two locations at the Islamic Center in the El Noor Mosque resulted in 45 people killed. And when you think about That's horrific numbers, 35 of those were at El Noor, five of them at Linwood, which is part of his impatience, I think, and inability to get inside the building and the ability of others to get away um, right. once the shooting started. But the people who he killed, not surprisingly, were as old as 77 years mm -hmm. old. But I think something that always kind of cuts into our hearts is we also hear that there was a three-year-old killed. Yeah. And that three-year-old yes. just happened to be there. Yeah. As we always no. say, indiscriminate, isn't it? Definitely. And in that community, all of these victims who are really shahada, that's the Arabic word for martyrs, which I hope I'm pronouncing that, but I've heard it before. So I think I'm right there on it. So a child that was three who was killed and a three-year-old is just there in their mom's arm. So he didn't care, which is not a surprise, but the shooter didn't care that he was just killing a child. He just fired. He just fired. He had this intent to do that. So that's terrible and sad and stupid. It makes me angry. Do they ever care though? Is there ever a moment where these shooters stop and think that's a step too far? Have you ever come across that? I have seen shooters stop. I've seen a middle school shooters who turn okay. a gun towards somebody and choose not to shoot that person. I've talked to people about an individual who comes into a business and says, I'm going to shoot my boss, but I'm not going to shoot this person. And they walk right past him. At the shooting at LAX International Airport in Los Angeles, the shooter wants to kill TSA agents, our transportation safety agents, who aren't even armed. They're just the ones who are checking to make sure you walk through a magnetometer and making sure you're not carrying a bomb on board. They're not even armed. And that shooter ran through a terminal at LAX and looked at plenty of other people, even asked somebody, are you with TSA? And that person said no. And so he went by. So sometimes shooters are focused on who they want to kill. And sometimes they just kill indiscriminately. Does that tell you anything about the kind of person that is committing this crime when you see that completely indiscriminate action? Yeah, to me, it's a couple of things. One is the shooter kind of absented himself from the human aspect yeah of what mm -hmm. was going on and decided I'm going to do this and I'm not going to think about it and just was acting very robotic, which allowed for the indiscriminate killing. Yeah. And also, I think in this case, we know also that the shooter, he was focused on killing everybody who he felt fit into a category. So then it doesn't matter because in that kind of broken logic, even a child is going to grow up to be the same person that he's killing. And so he's just getting that child out of the way early. Do you class this as domestic terrorism? It was classified as domestic terrorism in that the subject had lived there for a while, but he's not from there. No, so, he's not. Um, do you know where he's from? I know that he's from Australia. There you go. Yeah, he's from yeah. Australia. Right. Yeah. He came to that country, they concluded, to commit this act. 
He was kind of shopping for a place in his mind where he could commit this violent act. And he made that decision that he could commit it in New Zealand at the mosques Mm. there. He did a lot of surveillance and made that decision to, to go there to do it. I will say this, every time a horrific shooting like this occurs, there's a lot of speculation based on what they see. And this guy was active online moments before he started firing. He sent a long, boring, hate-filled, triggering Mm -hmm. missive out. He sent it to law enforcement, but he sent it to other people because he wanted to create this image of he's somebody important who has his philosophical positions in life and basically cut and pasted stuff. And really it was designed to be provocative, right? Mm, Yeah. So he mails this out to 30 people, including like media outlets and the prime minister's office. The concept is that I'm going to say things that are provocative and absurd to get people to think that I am this important person you should listen to. Like for instance, one of the things that he said is I played these violent video games and maybe that's what turned me into a killer. Right. You know, video games, including violent video games are one of the most popular entertainment activities in the world. And it's also one of the big myths about killers. I'm sure you've said this to me before. There's no research that backs that up. Is that correct? Actually, there's a ton of research that actually says that's not true. You know, do you want your child to play violent video games that show people stabbing each other and shooting each other? Maybe you don't. I I didn't even own a video system when my kids were growing up. And if you asked them, they would point that out because they were so annoyed. (laughs) Yeah. So deprived. Right. They were very deprived. And that's fine. That was a choice that I made. But when something like 90% of children between the ages of 10 and 19 have played video games in 95% in the United States. It's like some ridiculous number. And that there are 10 times more video game players overseas in Southeast yeah. Asia and Asian markets and where they're so popular that they are gaming events that people pay a ticket to go and watch screens of other people playing video games. The video game industry is, it's huge. It's the, like the largest growing sports industry. And plus they're not all violent, right? I mean, of sure, course, FIFA. some would say, yeah, or expositions and building cities, but there's also mm. conquering and games playing where you work together to try to defeat the dragon kind of stuff. Those are all video games too. So a lot of people play video games, but he specifically put in his document how he thought you know, well, maybe that was it. And in fact, in New Zealand, they were so offended by it. It was so objectionable and the laws are so different there than they are here in the United States that the video footage and the document this guy released are banned. Possessing it and distributing it are banned in New Zealand. Also, immediately after it happened, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern basically banned his name as well. Yes, Crazy. That's something that would never happen here because I happen to have, as I always do, because I'm a nerd. If you're just listening to this, I'm holding up a copy of the United States Constitution. Yeah. Because also I'm a boring lawyer. And the first amendment to our Constitution is 45 simple words that have to do with freedom of the press, freedom of expression, freedom of association. Not in New Zealand. Right. So here in the United States, we're not going to ban free expression unless it leads to violence. We talk about not naming the shooter here in the United States. And 10 years ago, we were naming shooters all the time. And now we're not. I try to encourage people to not talk about the shooter and don't use his picture. I say that to every media entertainment group that I talk to. And and I think it's important too, because, you know, when he sent this little missive out, one of the things that he said is that he hoped that his mass shooting would cause more mass shootings in the United States and conflicts over gun control issues in the United States that would lead to civil war. What? Yeah. Okay. I think we need to rewind a little bit and let's talk about his original motivation for doing it. Was he just a complete out and out racist? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about maybe who he was too. At the time of the shooting, he was 28. So from the time that he was a young person until 28 is not that many years. And he managed to develop this whole personality. He grew up, as you mentioned, in Australia, in New South Wales. His parents were separated when he was young. His mom developed a relationship with another person. That person was abusive to her and to the children. 
So he had a challenging childhood. Before he came to New Zealand, when he was in his teens, or around the age of majority, his father was diagnosed with a very severe aggressive type of cancer and committed suicide. So his father had a certain amount of money and he and his sister both inherited $457,000 in whatever that translates into in Australia. So Australian dollars, but not US dollars for those listening. So who knows what the exchange rate is right now, but either way, that is not a small amount of money. No. So here he is in his twenties, angry at the world. And he spends a tremendous amount of time on the internet. Hello, parents note to self. He spends a tremendous amount of time on the internet unsupervised and trolling and looking through sites that include material about this great replacement theory as some moron coined it. Maybe that's a bad thing for me to say on the podcast. No, Um, definitely not. But you're going to need to explain a little bit more about the replacement theory. Just from a simple standpoint, it's this concept that, for instance, I'm Caucasian. I live in the United States. My parents live in the United States. They're white also. And now people are moving in from other countries. And as these migrants emigrate to the United States, they're replacing the true people who belong here, the whites who belong here. Because mm. in the United States, there was a, certainly a time period when, first of all, the non-white population wasn't counted because they weren't considered human. And there was a concept that the United States was filled with primarily whites, but it was majority white, 60, 70, 80% white. And as the migrants emigrate, then they replace us. Yeah. Who owns the wealth in the country? Oh, it's suddenly these people who are emigrating. Isn't it interesting that he's an Australian by birth, yet he's gone into another country to make a statement about immigration? Yes, it, it is interesting. And I think a couple of things. I think that the absurdity of the great replacement theory is that whites are not from this country. They're all immigrants. So we replaced the native population that was here. And I think that in New Zealand, what would be the native population? Maori and Aboriginal in Australia. I mean, we're all colonies of Britain. You know, painting with a broad brush here, the whites moved into your country, Australia, my country. And yet the absurdity of somebody thinking that replacing the whites is unnatural because we're the ones who belong here. Like what? It just, it it makes my blood boil. Yeah. So he's definitely begins to indoctrinate himself into this very early on. Because this is not something he's been brought up in. This is something that he has actually almost, it's been outsourced essentially. He's getting this information from the internet. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think this is an issue that that does come up. I was here with the FBI working during 9-11 and we were very concerned about individuals who were instructed by terrorist groups from overseas to commit terrorist acts here in the United States. And on 9-11, 2001, we had the most horrific of terrorist acts here when four different planes were hijacked at the same time so they could be crashed into locations by a number of people who were trained, planned for it, and funded by overseas resources. So international terrorists. And then what we had after 9-11 was this idea of even still in the United States and in other foreign countries from us, so in the UK and the United States, we continued to be worried about other people who would be directed by foreign terrorist organizations to commit terrorist acts Mm. or even inspired Mm. and and inspired by it. And I think that's essentially what we're seeing now is individuals who are inspired, not because they're directed by anybody, but they see others. They see the Christ church shooting. We have shooters here in the United States who release missives that have adopted 50 pages from the Christ church shooters missives and then released it in claiming it's their own and their philosophy when really what they're doing is they're just trying to mimic to try to be important. It's that global contagion factor now, isn't it? Very much so. 
and we definitely see it. You know, the other thing that kind of strikes me about this whole situation is, you know, there's that criminal cycle of people who are perhaps born into maybe a gang and then they repeat the cycle, they can't get out of it. This is a person that's born into a situation and then these outside influences come into it from the, you know, person next door or the parent. It's a silent transfer of information. They're not necessarily seeing this radicalization, are they? No, that's true. And I think that's one of the reasons why when we talk about how do you stop somebody like this, uh, you really have to look for the outward signs. You know, if somebody starts putting Nazi symbols and tattoos on their body, they're probably a white supremacist. They're probably a neo-Nazi. You need to start looking. If that's your child, as we say in the United States, you can believe whatever you want, but if you act on it, we're going to arrest you. So you can be the biggest racist or misogynist person in the world if you want to be that person. And that's sad that you might want to be that. But if you act on it, we're going to arrest you. The people who are going to see somebody become that racist that acts on that racism, that becomes a misogynist who acts on that with violence towards women, who wants to become a neo-Nazi and acts on that belief that people who are not their race should not Mm -hmm. exist anymore. The people around them should see their conduct, should see them change their ways, change their clothing, change their appearance, shave their head, get tattoos, post things on their social media pages, spend time on websites. The FBI director was interviewed recently and said that we think that in some cases, these shooters, the technology has allowed them to find each other internationally and egg each other on. Isn't that a disgusting thought? It's an absolutely disgusting thought. And as you've already alluded to, this Christchurch massacre actually did inspire. Which one was it? I know you're mixing all these cases together. It was the Buffalo, New York supermarket shooting. The Buffalo, New York supermarket shooting. I'm pretty positive that was it. Honestly, we've had such a terrible spate of shootings in the summer across the globe that have been these unfortunately spectacular shootings. Mm. The Buffalo shooting, it was a grocery store in New York. The shooter came from one area, drove to Buffalo, New York, killed 13 people at the store, specifically drove to a black neighborhood. He was white. He drove to a black neighborhood and went there because he was looking for a place where he would have more blacks to shoot. Isn't that sad? Yeah. It's more blacks so, to so shoot. Horrible. It's unbelievable. But it's the replacement theory that has mm-hmm. influenced both those shootings. And I'm sure you told me in that episode that he referenced Christchurch. He did. They write things and ship them to other people because they're influenced by a shooter. And because they think that shooter is important. Yeah. They think I can be important if I do what that shooter did. Well, a couple of factors I think play into here just about his background. Early on, he becomes a member of a gun club and he begins shooting. He's living in Dunedin at the time. Saying that right? That's my old hometown. Okay, there you go. So he's living there and he becomes a member of a gun club. And tell me, how hard is it to get a gun? in New Zealand? Well, you've got to get a license. I've never tried to get one. I've actively tried not to have one passed on to me. I know that much when we've had like a rabbit shooting gun in the family. And my dad was like, hey, I'm going to pass this on to the grandkids. And we all went, no, you can keep that. Thanks very much. Not going to be passed on to my house. And to get a license, do you know what you have to do to do that in New Zealand? Well, I feel really ignorant, but I'm sure there's some hoops you've got to jump through. We wouldn't be handing it out willy nilly. There are some hoops and some of those hoops include having people essentially who vouch for you because how would the police know that you're a person of good character, right? So you have to pony up the names of a couple of people. So he starts as a young child beginning to believe that he is from some master race and then he inherits this money. So before he gets to Dunedin, he begins to travel. He spends a couple of years traveling all over the world. He probably takes 30 trips, probably blows through most of his money. And he's traveling, 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 traveling. And in the meantime, he makes a decision that he's going to go to New Zealand because maybe that's an easier place for him to kill people. And so he moves to New Zealand. And then of course he has to get 
a license to carry a gun. He, con he convinces a couple of people. One is a kid who he's played gamings uh, with. And I say kid, I mean a younger person. And the kid's dad to be his endorsers to get his license. And presumably he hasn't known them for a huge amount of time. The dad had met him maybe twice. And the Royal Commission report that comes out at the end of the shooting makes it clear that there are missed signs. Right. In terms of getting access to that weapon. Getting access to semi-automatic weapons in New Zealand is a lot easier than people think. That's what they discover. And you know what? When you say why he may have chosen New Zealand versus Australia, we've done a, an episode earlier in the season on Port Arthur massacre. And after that, all those gun restrictions came into force. There was the massive buyback of the semi-automatic weapons over there. So would that mm -hmm. have played into the fact that maybe he couldn't have accessed enough right. firepower in Australia and New Zealand was the next option? Right. He's looking for an easy way. It's next door, so to speak. Yeah. Right. And Air Moana had occurred, but access was there. He obviously found that the access was easier there. The reports and the investigation afterwards found out that he had spent a few years planning this shooting. A few years. Imagine. Wow. Uh, that wow. by the time that he moved to New Zealand, he only moved there to commit this act of violence. What? Um, I just want to, I'm not going to swear, but just insert bleeps sure. here. Right, exactly. Listen to this little tidbit, because what are we looking for when we try to prevent? Well, leakage. I mean, I was literally thinking of this guy just by himself in his room, but of course he's got to have a job. Or maybe he doesn't. So what is he doing with his life? Who is he interacting with? He had a job for a while working in a gym. At the same time, he was abusing steroids, which make you rage, right? Yeah, roid rage. Exactly, roid rage, as they call it, right? And he's around people. Now, when you think about this person sitting by himself, he isn't just by himself. He's playing video games. He's online chatting with people. Others are seeing and hearing him, but they may be like-kinded, right? He may be going to locations and sites where everybody else is there. And as FBI Director Ray said, the people there are egging him on to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. You feel this way, do something about it. Okay, but he's actually got a functioning job outside that. He does for a while. He has a physical injury. He is okay. treated for steroid abuse. Is treated this in New Zealand? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so what should you be hearing? He was treated for steroid abuse. Abuse, exactly. Should you be able to access a weapon when you've got a history of drug abuse? Clearly you can. The conclusion from the commission was that if that had been reported, it might've led to a reevaluation of his authority to carry a gun, his fitness to carry a gun. Was the steroid abuse clocked after he already had the license or before he had the license? After he had the license, but the licenses are ongoing. Okay. So when something is reported. It still could have been pulled at that stage. Missed marker one. Right, right. We have a shooter who shoots two locations. He has grown up filled with hate. He's on his way to a fourth location and he gets stopped. He has only in his head this idea that he is going to kill all of these people. And that's why he moves to this country, moves to this country. He, when he moves to the country, he does surveillance to look at the mosque. He chooses which mosque he should go to first. And they know that he thought about, well, this has more migrants, more immigrants, more people who are coming to this country. Part of the theory for many who are white supremacists or neo-Nazis who believe in this theory is that Muslims don't belong in any of these countries and they're part of the problem here in the United States. We hear that same thing about Mexicans and anybody with a Spanish descent. Oh, they don't belong here. Despite the fact that the Southern part of the United States was part of Mexico for a long time, yeah. but Hey, we don't let the facts get in the way, right? Mm. You know, he had all this money. He gave money to these far right movements. He was very out there in terms of supporting them. He was making statements. He would comment online about how he was supportive of these groups. He definitely spoke about violence. There was a police report about him. I think the final report showed that there were 
eight interactions with him. Mm -hmm. He's 28 years old. There were like eight interactions by different kind of agencies in the time period before he committed this act. One of them was somebody who filed a report against him because he posted on the internet. I hope that one day you get the end of the rope and the police are like, just block him. And then they didn't do anything else about it. I don't know what they could have done. So is this um, in New Zealand? I think the crack on the rope comment was when he was still in. This was in his head. This is where he was headed. He's a racist by the time he's 10, probably, or 12. He's working in the gym. He gets injured. He starts taking steroids. He is thinking this whole time about, I'm going to commit these acts. He has conflicts. He, he gives money away to these white supremacist groups and these far-right groups. Then two years before, so the shooting is in 19. So in 17, he kind of moves his hate base in Australia to his hate base in New Zealand. And then he's just focused on finding locations. I think that one of the things that we know is that in their final report, it said, we're satisfied that by January of 17, the individual had a terrorist attack in mind. We are satisfied that when he came to live in New Zealand on 17 August, 2017, it was with a fully developed terrorist ideology based on his adoption of this great replacement theory and his association and related beliefs that immigration, particularly by Muslim migrants into the Western countries is an existential threat to Western society and that the appropriate response for him was violence. So he just literally spent all his energy and all his life looking Mm -hmm. at trying to create havoc and kill people. What a waste of oxygen. In the aftermath and the analysis of him afterwards, there's talk about, oh, you know, maybe he was bullied at school. He didn't have a lot of school friends that he became very quickly to respect anti-Semites and other people who hate, right? You know, it's different than what we experience here in the States. We have civil rights and civil responsibilities concepts here and the idea of inclusion and how we want to make sure that we don't foment any racist views. I found this interesting. Under the New South Wales system, their Department of Education has a anti-racism policy, like most Department of Educations do. In New South Wales, they have anti-racist contact officers. So it's like right in your face. You go to the school. Who do you contact? Oh, I'm going to contact the anti-racism contact officer. We don't have anything like that in the United States. Mm. But I think that speaks to the need for it, that somebody put the money behind it to try and stop it. This shooting was terrible. It had so many bad things that came out of it because we had somebody who chose to raise himself to hate and then had an opportunity to execute it. He manipulated the system to get weapons, even in a country where it was presumably more difficult, but then let's look at when this happened. It wasn't that long ago, right? This shooting was in 19, 19. Yeah. So in 17, in a country where we think it's hard to get a weapon, he obtains many weapons and a lot of ammunition just by gaming the system and really led government officials to say, we have to reevaluate how we issue licenses for weapons and who we allow to buy firearms and ammunition. And this actually did change the rules, didn't it? It did. And I think the report that came out, one of the things I think that struck me was that they said, you know, essentially that there was lip service given to it. They're like, oh, well, he put up a couple of names and these people said, he seems like a pretty good guy. And that was really all he needed at 26 to start buying semi-automatic weapons and ammunition in New Zealand. And why is that any different than what you can do here in the United States? Yeah. Right? You just game the system. We don't have a system in the United States where there's any checks in general. You don't have to have people vouch for you. But I think a lot of countries that make it tougher to buy guns, you do have to come in and fill out an explanation for why you want the gun. A lot of the countries have that. And then they also have maybe mental health checks and interviews with people. We don't do any of that in the United States in terms of background. We do other things, but we don't do any of that. No. And in New Zealand, am I not right in saying that literally, I think maybe a week later, semi-automatic rifles and weapons were banned? Yes. Good old Queen Jacinda Ardern, our prime minister, just went right through and went, nope, not having that. Yeah, we're not doing that. And I think we saw some of that recently. We've seen some of that in Canada, the same thing. When the shooting started in the United States, uh, you know, Canada changed its laws in response. Canada was like, we're done with that. Yeah. Hey, we see what's happening over the border. 
<laughs> exactly. You know, we've talked about the shootings in Canada and Canada is equally worried about what's going on up there. There is an amazing podcast series called Our Darkest Day. And it is the stories from the victims' families and from the victims and the survivors. And it's really powerful. And I tell you what, you are going to need to hydrate heavily before you listen oh. to it because you will be in bits. I'm glad to hear that's there. Yeah. I, I know we don't talk in detail about the victims in, in our podcast, and that's a choice that kind of I've made in part because I don't want to re-victimize them. I think people have to be prepared to hear that. And I think the victims have to be willing to tell their stories. And we've had on some, we'll have on more. And that's okay when it comes from their mouths. I try to focus more on leading you down the path of how could we have prevented this shooting? Mm. And so I guess I would tell you this, not surprisingly, this subject has been sentenced to life in prison without parole for 51 murders in total mm -hmm. for acts of terrorism and for 40 attempted murders. This is New Zealand's first ever terrorist conviction. And so first time they've even given anybody life without parole. So maybe my question to you might be, at this point, based on what you've heard, do you see any ways that this shooter could have been stopped before? What signs were missed? Oh, I don't know. I feel like I need to do a deep dive into those two years before when he moved to Dunedin to really find out what he was doing, because I'm sure there was leakage along the way. There was clearly going to be leakage over a two year period for somebody that has planned it for that amount of time and has obviously got the roid rage going on as well. One marker. Definitely. I think that the challenge that we see in these kinds of situations is that this individual was more isolated, right? There wasn't a crowd that he hung out with. He spent a couple of years traveling. So he was a yeah. little nomadic. And because of that, there wasn't really anybody keeping a bead on him, which is just the bad term because that's a gun term. When you see that bead, B E A. -D, oh, a bead. Oh, okay. keeping a bead Lost on in him. translation. Gotcha. You know, that the laser, the red dot. Right. 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 And then, you know, when you have to identify a friend who can tell you whether you're fit and proper for a license and the system is set up to not actually look too far beyond. That right. was definitely a problem. But what about the doctor who treated him for steroid abuse? Is there a reporting system in New Zealand? I don't know. Did you find out if there was or not when you were doing your there research is. for it? There's there a, is, okay. And is it voluntary like America or is it mandatory that you would have to report that? I think it's voluntary in that doctors okay. make a decision about whether they think this might have... Uh, an influence, but that presumes the doctor knew he had a firearms license, doesn't it? And it does. And it also presumes that he's got more than a 15 minute consultation with somebody who has a, a drug addiction. That's not a whole picture. Right. You see the little pieces that we're trying to catch all these parts. What do you think would have prevented this happening? Is there anything that you go, that's where they missed it? You know, I'd love to see somebody, anybody have a conscience who was online with them at any given point. I think people need to report right. things. There needs to be a way to report things to somebody and, and say, boy, I'm concerned about this person. So many times, as I've said before, they have a death wish also. And so that's part of it is there was leakage probably, but maybe no way, no place to report leakage, which is probably one of the biggest failures that I see here in this country and other countries is there's no systematic way to report leakage once you get out of school. You know, in school, yeah. you report it to the school principal or you report it to a counselor and, you know, they call the parents. But once you get out of school, 18, 19, 20, we've got people in their 20s, in their 30s, they're distraught. And the first time we know they're really distraught is when they show up at their place of work to shoot somebody. Yeah. And so that's a hard part is that there isn't a mechanism in place to do what we would call threat assessment and threat management. Now there's some yeah. laws that are in place, like here in the United States, they've started to pass a lot of what we call by slang red flag laws, which might take a weapon out of the hands of somebody who might be a threat to himself or others based on a moment in time. But the, even the places that have licenses, like we saw in New Zealand, they may have a rule that says they should check and you have an ongoing obligation to be mentally fit to hold that gun or carry that gun, but there's not really money and systems in place to check on you. Nobody's knocking on your door to see if you're okay. And really that puts all the burden on family and friends and employers and coworkers. 
And in this kid's yeah. case, he had a lot of money. He could do what he wanted. Nobody asked, uh, you know, where he was going and what he was doing. And so even if people had stuff and they reported some things, we saw some reporting. I think that this is a situation where the purchase of the firearms fell through the cracks and maybe would have found a way to get those anyway, is what some would say. Mm -hmm. But I'd sure like to have had him try in another way in New Zealand. Like you said, he probably left Australia thinking, I can't get the weapons that I need here. I'm going to go to New Zealand. Exactly. Exactly. So I think there's that. And also just the idea that, you know, if you're a, an elementary school student or middle school student or secondary school mm -hmm. student, and you're talking about hate and white supremacy, and you're writing memos, which I don't know if he particularly did here, but we see shooters who write school documents talking about this and admiring shooters. That's all leakage. The people around them should understand, especially in younger people, that hate develops into action. To me, the biggest takeaway from this is that the place that he probably was the most obviously overtly expressing of his horrific intentions was online. It makes me want to run and tell every parent out there, if you've got a child that's online playing a game, be aware, because it's not likely that the child's necessarily even thinking to report it. I think especially young people are so impressionable and they so yeah. want to belong. It is exactly the same conduct that we see in gang members, kids right. in neighborhoods who want to belong. They don't have enough cohesion in their community, in their family, or in their school, in their church or whatever. They're looking for something to belong to. And oh, when they don't so have sad. something else to grasp on, they grasp on to this. And white supremacy yeah. is so prevalent out there. And the internet has given us this avenue to eliminate borders, right? It has. And this didn't happen in the US. This can happen anywhere. And I think that's the part that is probably stunning for me is that Christchurch shootings are going to continue in other parts of the world. So mm -hmm. even though we talk so much about how there's this gun violence in the United States, it happens in other countries. And it happens, we see much more from a terrorist standpoint, much more from an ideological standpoint. They're not mm -hmm. necessarily somebody who's mad about their job and mad that their friends won't invite them to the prom, like we see ridiculous shootings here. Yeah. And instead, they are terrorist motivated shootings of people who are in many cases, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, believers in the great replacement theory. It's hatred without borders. Hey, there we go. Hatred without borders. That's going to be the name of the episode here. I know some of the stories of bravery and hope that came out of this, but I would love to find out what you've pulled out. Let me just share. I can just share one with you. Okay. Because that's unusual for you. You normally give me like two and then sneak in a third. I would never do that. I just want to share one because there are so many moments of bravery. In fact, all right, maybe I'll give you two. There was a standard, there, right, standard. She did it. There was a, an individual who lunged at the shooter and was killed, but how brave that he chose to do that was at the yeah. Elmer mosque. He chose to do that and decided if it was going to be his last act was going to be to try to save his fellow worshipers. So he was obviously honored after his death. Honored still alive was another individual who I'm going to mess his name up, but I'm going to try it anyway, because I, I want to respect who he is. Okay. Abdulaziz Wahabazada. Mm -hmm. And all due respect to Mr. Wahabazada, if I pronounced your name wrong, but I think I'm pretty close. He was at the Islamic Center. And when the second shooting occurred, I think I mentioned that the shooter first shot from outside and he drop that. And he went to his car to get another weapon. And Mr. Wahab took something and literally threw it at him to try wow. to distract him. And when that didn't work and the shooter got another weapon, he didn't give up. That's the message for the day. Don't give up. You want to save your life. You want to save the lives of others. Don't give up in the rare circumstance this happens to you. Because when he couldn't stop this guy by throwing a payment terminal, like it's a big box, it's heavy. And he threw it at this guy trying to stop him from shooting. When that didn't work, he picked up this empty shotgun that this guy had dropped. He picked it up and he ran over to some of the cars nearby and he's yelling at the shooter. He's like, I'm over here. I'm over here. I'm over here. He's trying to get the shooter distracted. It allowed people in the mosque 
to flee as best they could. So, so brave. He's fight all he's the way. Fight. Run, hide, fight. He allowed others to run yeah. because he fought for them. He fought oh, for their lives. What an amazing and human. Remember how many people died at the first mosque, a large number, 40 some, and how many people died at this A handful, all of the deaths are bad, but less at the Islamic center in part because of this guy outside. When the shooter shot a few more people inside, came back out, this guy was still there. He was oh still there. God. And instead no of running way. away, no kidding. He threw the shotgun at this guy as he climbed into wow. his car and drove away, he threw the shotgun at him. He was wow. not going to let that guy get away with anything more than he could. So he was a constant distraction to that guy. And so at that point, the shooter drove away. He was awarded the New Zealand cross, which is oh. their highest award for bravery. That, and well-deserved, my goodness. It is amazing. Indeed. That is a beautiful story of bravery. I'm so pleased that you found that one. If you wanted to hear even more stories in the podcast, Our Darkest Day, the victims' families and some of the survivors, the reason that they're telling their story is to have their loved ones remembered, which I think is absolutely beautiful. So if you I do want that. to hear more, that's why they've put the stories out there. They want to make sure that the memories and the last acts of these very brave people are remembered. I love that. I think that in the end, it's really about the lives that are lost and how we want to try to remember those yeah. people. And we owe it to them to do a better job next time. We owe it to the people who are brave enough to step forward. And we see those in all of the terrible stories that we talk about. There are always people who are brave, who stand to fight against seemingly impossible odds. And I think that it's a opportunity to hear stories about lives lost, but also how blessed we were to have them on earth while we have them here.